Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Robin Lewis and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about cholesterol. More specifically, I'm looking to you guys out there who have been told that you have high cholesterol, prescribed a medication, and now what? Let's get straight to the point. Some of you are taking that medication and you don't even know why. Or you've completely rejected the idea. You're looking for supplements on the internet, you don't really know what you're doing, or why you should care. This video is designed to help you understand what is cholesterol, why should I care about cholesterol, what does it mean to be at a high risk of heart attack, stroke, and things like that, and really give you the information that you need to make an educated decision on what therapy is best for you. We're gonna start by first going over what is cholesterol. So what is this thing that your doctor is mentioning and what is it really doing in the body? So cholesterol itself is actually kind of an umbrella term for quite a few different things. So I would argue that you should all be looking at the labs that your doctor is running and then therefore making an educated decision on whether or not to put you on medications. Or if you're seeing someone like a naturopath, then you're starting to talk about things like cholesterol lowering diets and supplements and herbs and the list of treatments go on. But the point is you as the patient want to get familiar with what you're even reading if you even read your lab results. So if you look at the panels, they're actually broken down into five different components. This is summarized as your lipid panel, that's what they call it. So it's basically talking about fats that are relevant to health. And that is the five that are most routinely being done. So this is, in my opinion, the bare minimum effort of what we're running for cholesterol. But unfortunately, it is what I see the most of in the conventional medical system. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And then in another video, we'll go over some of the labs that you should be running if you really wanna do a thorough job and really understand what's happening with someone's cholesterol. But for now, the basics. So first thing you're gonna notice when you get that sheet back from your doctor with your lab results on it is total cholesterol. So this is talking about all of the cholesterol in your blood. So if we were to mash up everything and just measure cholesterol as a whole, this is what we're looking at. The reason I mentioned that is because the way cholesterol is transported in the body isn't actually just free floating cholesterol because cholesterol is a fat based molecule and your blood is water based. And if you know anything about basic science, those two generally do not mix well together. So you're gonna to have to package up your cholesterol and other fats that need to get delivered to places into a vessel that is water conducive. So this is where we get into things like lipoproteins. And this is where we get into things like good cholesterol versus bad cholesterol, because they're actually referring to the vessels and not just cholesterol as a whole. So first thing, it's a very broad measure and oftentimes people are not being prescribed medications based on total cholesterol. They're usually getting prescribed based on things called LDL cholesterol. So that is what we deem the bad cholesterol. And that is because it's the LDL cholesterol that has been known to contribute to plaque formation. So it is kind of the most looked after, the most paid attention to out of the whole lipid panel because it has really good science behind it saying it will lead to plaque formation. And I will go over it later in the video, but that is not the only thing that leads to plaque formation. There's actually three main steps to building plaque inside of your arteries and your veins, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Next up, we have HDL cholesterol. So this is our good cholesterol. It's known as the cholesterol particle that goes and cleans things up. So generally speaking, we want HDL to be high and something like LDL cholesterol or LDLC as it shows up on your panel to be low. Then we're gonna find something called TG or triglycerides. So these are another type of fat. They're actually different in structure than something like cholesterol, but they also will elevate your risk of heart attack and stroke. And it's actually more associated with things like diabetes so triglycerides can kind of be their own little thing going on and it can lead you down different paths. But generally speaking, you just can know that you don't want it above reference range and generally speaking, that's not a good thing. 
Last but not least, they're gonna be talking about a ratio. So all of the non-HDL cholesterol versus HDL cholesterol. So that's just, again, a rough approximation of like how many of the bad guys versus the good guys. Like, do you have a really high proportion of those bad ones? Then generally speaking, we're a little bit more worried. But if I was to say anything, just know about LDL cholesterol because generally speaking, that is the one that your doctor is then going to be prompted to be like, okay, we need to put you on a cholesterol lowering therapy of some sort. And in the case of a lot of conventional medicine, that is gonna be drug therapy, like things like statins, which are the number one kind. Or if you're coming to see someone like myself and you're not too far progressed, we might talk about other things like diet, lifestyle, herbs, like really get to the brunt of what's causing the cholesterol, which again, we're gonna talk about. So now that you have a basic understanding of what you're looking at when you get your test results and what your doctor is referring to when they're making decisions, I want to talk about why cholesterol leads to things like heart attack and stroke, because ultimately that is why we care about cholesterol. And heart attacks and strokes are the leading cause of death globally. So this is something that is relevant for everybody. This is something we can all be working towards preventing, and in fact, it is 80% preventable. So this is very realistic. So why do we care about cholesterol? Specifically LDL cholesterol, specifically bad cholesterol. Well, it's because it gets into the arterial walls and forms things like plaque. I'm gonna go over all of the steps of how to form plaque so you can really understand what that means and specifically dive into LDL cholesterol's role. So first thing to developing a plaque is you need some sort of injury to the endothelial wall. So what do I mean by endothelial wall? I mean the lining of your blood vessels. So something kind of breaks the blood vessel wall and then the LDL cholesterol is allowed to enter there and if it is there met by inflammation, then the formation of a plaque will start. So again, first thing, something to damage the wall. Second thing, LDL cholesterol needs to be around and get into the wall. Third thing, there needs to be inflammation. So all three of these things are necessary. But let me tell you why that's an issue, is the other two, other than cholesterol, are pretty hard to control definitely goals to control and we will spend time in other videos talking about that but they can be hard to eradicate we'll just say so for example things that damage the wall of your blood vessel smoke so cigarette smoke pollution things that we inhale that are toxic high blood sugars i'm not just talking about diabetes i'm talking about people who have up and down spikes to their blood sugars too much glucose, AKA the sugar that we're talking about in blood sugars, will damage the lining of those walls. So it'll directly kind of nick them up. There is a lot of things that can potentially damage that wall. And so it's pretty hard to confidently say you've got that completely under control, but it's definitely something to pay attention to. The other thing, the third component to forming plaque is inflammation. And we all know there are tons of things creating inflammation. So for example, you could have a dietary imbalance of something as simple as your omega-3 fatty acids to your omega-6s. If you have too many sixes and not enough threes, then you're generally promoting inflammation. It can be things like inflammatory conditions. So autoimmune conditions have a huge inflammation component. So that's things like rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, lupus, Crohn's, colitis, there's lots of autoimmune conditions that are prevalent in our population and that definitely causes damage to our cardiovascular system and creates a lot of inflammation in a lot of different places. So they're generally worried about LDL cholesterol because you can almost guarantee there will be some damage and some inflammation happening. And so if we can kind of lower the opportunities for cholesterol to get in, then that is one of the many different ways you can kind of help someone with preventing things like heart attack and stroke. All right, so now let's talk about risk factors. When they say that you're at a higher risk of heart attack and stroke, what does that really mean? Okay, so if they're doing good medicine, then they will be basing that off of something called the Framingham. 
It is one of the best calculators for really determining risk, but these risk calculators are far more well-rounded than just cholesterol alone. And so that means if your doctor is saying you're in a high risk category, but they're not checking all of these different components, then they actually don't know what your risk factor is. Okay, so let's give you an example. Let's paint a little picture. Say you're 50 years old and you have not been plagued for any of these other risk factors, but you do have elevated cholesterol. So if you had nothing going on, you're at about a 7% chance of having a heart attack or a stroke in the next 10 years. If you have elevated cholesterol, that could go up to about an 8% chance. If you have very elevated cholesterol, maybe a nine, but it's only a difference of one to 2% when you add high cholesterol into the equation. Of course, the more things you add, the higher the percentage goes, but that's a really simplified way of looking at it. So if you do get those cholesterol levels under control, it can lower that risk by a couple percent. And they have seen that when they look at things like statin therapies. So for someone that might be great, that might be an amazing result for them and it's worth it. For other people, especially those that get really aggressive side effects with things like statins, which can most commonly present itself as muscle aches and things like that, joint pains, they might say this risk does not outweigh the negatives of this, especially if that's preventing you from moving, which is making your weight go up, your quality of life go down, things like that. So these are the pieces of information that people are really just not getting told. And this is why I wanted to make this video so you guys can kind of gear yourself up with at least the foundational understanding so you can decide what you're putting into your body and make that decision from a very educated place. All right, last but not least, we're gonna talk about why you have high cholesterol in the first place. And I'm just gonna start out by saying this is not an extensive list, but really just the common top things that are leading to elevated cholesterol, and certainly you can go more nuanced than this. The first thing I wanna talk about, because it's most often misunderstood, is something like diet. The first thing you need to understand is it's not cholesterol in your diet that is increasing the cholesterol that your doctor is measuring on your blood test. Dietary cholesterol counts for so little of your total cholesterol measured in your blood that it's almost negligible. So you do not have to worry about things like the cholesterol in your eggs and the cholesterol in other foods. That's really just an urban myth and it's been disproven many times over. And in fact, 85% of that cholesterol floating around in your blood was self-made, meaning it didn't come from external sources, it was made inside of your body. So that's why dietary cholesterol really isn't what we're concerned about. But of course, diet does play a good role. The issue is the diet that's going to help your cholesterol get low and get into this optimal zone can vary from person to person. So genetics have a big role to play in this. Some people tolerate a high fat diet better. Some tolerate a high carb diet better. A lot of people aren't getting their protein requirements, but everyone's responses to these things can be a little bit different. And there's of course the things that we know will not help cholesterol, like fried fatty foods, like tons of processed foods, refined carbohydrates and things like that. And there are a couple really good diets out there. For example, the portfolio diet is a diet designed to lower cholesterol. And so the point I'm trying to make isn't that we should all go on the portfolio diet, but really just to play around with it. Try a couple different diets, give it a good shot, really put in the effort to change your dietary habits, but do not get discouraged if you happen to not respond to that particular diet. Unfortunately, everyone's a little bit different and if everybody was the same, I wouldn't have a job. We would just have computers giving you therapeutic plans all over the place. So individual differences really do play a role here, but there is a diet that is right for you. And if you do hit the sweet spot with diet, it can reduce your cholesterol by up to 20%. So usually no more than 20%, but 20% reduction with just diet alone is usually very good for most people. The next thing up I wanna talk about is your weight. So again, this conversation always comes up where it's like, what's the good weight, what's the bad weight? 
They're usually using the BMI calculator, which is a very inaccurate calculator to make these decisions. But just know in general, if you have more visceral fat, AKA abdominal fat, that tends to be higher risk. And certainly if you're carrying a lot of extra weight that you know is not your optimal, that is something that you could work towards as well. I kind of already mentioned this next one, but I'm gonna dive a little deeper, and that is talking about genetic conditions. So there are conditions that are very well known, like familial hypercholesterolemia. I know it's a mouthful. (laughs) So that particular condition, it runs in families. People will have very high cholesterol. There can be markers like LPA, which have a genetic link to them. But the point is, if you do have heart disease that runs in the family, get checked early because these sort of people with this type of condition tend to have heart attacks before the age of 50. And in fact, they found that 50% of men and 30% of women with this genetic condition will have a heart attack before the age of 50. The good news is, so even if it's written in your genes that you have high cholesterol, if you do things to lower that cholesterol, you will have an 80% reduction in your risk. So this is disproportionate to the general population. I'm not telling people that the average Joe who lowers their cholesterol will be reduced in risk by 80%, not at all. But in these genetic conditions, these people, because their cholesterol is so high at such an early age, you can do wonders for prevention with them. So go get your cholesterol checked early is kind of the point, especially if things run in your family. The next one I wanna talk about is one of my favorites because this one goes missed all of the time. And in my eyes, it changes the complete course of treatment. And that is if you have low thyroid function. So hypothyroid or low thyroid function will actually increase your cholesterol. So in those particular people, I'm actually trying to regulate their thyroid versus going straight after the cholesterol. And if you can get that thyroid under control, you will watch the cholesterol correct itself. So this is called root cause medicine. This is what we're really getting at with naturopathic medicine or functional medicine doctors or whoever you're going to see that's more holistically focused. We're trying to get at the root cause of your cholesterol issues. And that does not always mean going directly after cholesterol itself. Last thing I want to talk about, because it's very, very common, is high blood sugars, high blood glucose, whatever you want to call it. It is a very big issue. So even if you're not full on diabetic, that does not mean you do not have early insulin resistance or troubles regulating your blood sugar. And in fact, one third of the North American population is pre-diabetic. Pre-diabetes are people who are more likely to develop full diabetes in the next five years or so. So these are people that if we catch things early, regulate things early, you will never go on to be a type two diabetic. But the problem is not very many people are doing that sort of preventative kind of medicine. And it's another reason your cholesterol can be high. So get your blood sugars checked, get your fasting insulin checked, things like that. It will do wonders for your prevention and it'll do wonders for your cholesterol levels. All right, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you learned a ton about cholesterol and your own body and how you can make an educated decision around whether or not to go on things like drug therapy. If you want a little bit more background onto the top things that create heart disease and elevate your risk of heart attacks and strokes, you can go back and watch my last episode where we kind of do an overview of the things, including cholesterol, that will increase your risk. And look forward to some new content coming next week. See you guys then.